Good morning to everybody. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Gandhinagar, uh, to come back to your home uh, state. It's always a different feeling. And uh, we're going to talk about difficult TB cases that we see in day-to-day -day management. HIV was the epidemic uh, 15 years back. TB is the epidemic currently. And uh, it's not that it's only, you know, we don't see it in different parts of the country. I get a lot of patients from Gujarat who have TB and who are actually missed. So probably we are facing an epidemic of TB even in Gujarat. Though Mumbai is the epicenter, I mean, what we see in Mumbai is nowhere what you see in the rest of the country. Even while COVID was on, we had a TB epidemic that went on and on and on. So this is something that we are going to see in our day-to-day -day practice, and we need to uh, know what are the problems which we face. How do I change the slides? It's not working. Okay, so you have this algorithm uh, which says that when should you suspect TB? This is by the NTEP, this is the National TB Elimination Program, which says any child who has fever, cough for more than two weeks, weight loss, or there is a contact with TB, you suspect TB, you do a chest x-ray, you do a CB NAT, that's your gene expert or your true NAT. And then you make a diagnosis of a, either a microbiological based TB or you make a diagnosis of uh, clinical TB. So, and depending on the kind of uh, TB that you have, whether it's rifampicin sensitive, you're going to start two months of HRZE with four months of HRE except for cases of spinal and neuro TB where your treatment duration is going to be totally one year. And you have these various FDCs that are available through the program. And it's very difficult to remember the band. So you have weight uh, ranges. So rifampicin is at around 15 milligram per kg per day. Isonize at 10, ethambutol at 20, and pyrazinamide at 35. Now let's go on to the first case. How, what happens when you're uh, treating these kind of patients? Now we had a 13 year old girl, she had abdominal TB and she was referred for further management after being on treatment for the last six months. So she'd already received TB treatment for six months and she was just not uh, getting better. Six months ago, her diagnosis of abdominal TB was based on fever and weight loss. A CT abdomen had shown portocable and mesenteric adenopathy. A peritoneal biopsy was done, which was suggestive of granulomas on histopath. And a gene expert had shown Vampicin sensitive, her chest x ray was normal. So she was started on the HRZ regimen, but she developed uh, drug induced liver injury after three weeks. So she was shifted to hepato safe anti TB treatment consisting of amic acid, levoflox, and ethambutol. Her delay took a long time, and after three months, she was shifted back to HR and E. Pyrazinamide was not given, and she was continued on levoflox. After six months, and she developed pain and swelling of both the knee joints. So anybody in the audience, what could be the cause of the knee pain? The child is not on pyrazinamide now. The child right now is on HRE and levoflox. Okay, so on examination, she has patella tap, which is positive. Levoflox in animal models is known to cause arthritis. So that's the first thing that was stopped was levoflox. Uric acid can sometimes increase with anti-TB treatment and her uric acid was normal. Then obviously she was worked up for all other autoimmune problems. Her ANA, DSDNA, RA factor were negative. Her X-ray showed a pencil thin cortex. So thinking that this could be scurvy, she was given vitamin seeds and NSAIDs. To know whether her TB was under control, an ultrasound abdomen was done, which shows normal. So her TB has come pretty much under control. So she was just given NSAIDs and you know stopped the levoflox. After a month, she had inability to sit on the floor. She just couldn't sit. Her MRI showed synovitis with moderate effusion with suprapatellar bursitis. And a synovial biopsy was done thinking whether the TB had spread, which shows chronic non-granulometous synovitis. So we don't know the reason. TB culture did not grow anything after six weeks. And the pain disappeared on its own after 15 days. Her TB treatment was given for totally nine months, considering three months of alternate regimen that she was on in view of Delhi. So the question is, what was the cause of this knee pain, which caused such severe disability that she could not even sit? 
we didn't do anything. We just continued our NTTV treatment. Reactive arthritis. Yeah, so this is known as Ponset's disease. Ponset's disease is a reactive acute onset polyarthritis, which is associated with active extra articular TB. So usually you have a TB and you may develop this arthritis or most of the times you have TB, you've started anti-TB treatment and you develop this arthritis. There's no cause for it. And it resolves just by continuation of AKT. So it's basically a reactive arthritis. The resolution of arthritis may take few weeks to six months and it's got a good prognosis. The only way to prove that is you prove there's no TB in that joint. So you may sometimes land up doing a biopsy as we did in this patient. We did a TB culture that showed no growth. So you still have to rule out TB before you say this is Ponset's disease. And the treatment is only you give, continue the anti-TB treatment and you add NSAIDs. So take a message from this case is basically that when you have arthritis in a TB patient and it's not TB, you must rule out drug induced uh, uric acid, which goes like a gout. So if you have a PZA which is going on, you'll keep that, that in mind. Keep in mind, quinolones could cause this. It could be TB itself causing it. And the last thing that you have to keep in mind is Ponset's disease, that's reactive arthritis. So just you need to reassure your patients that there's nothing serious and it will go away on its own. Now we come to a second case. This is a 14 year old girl. She came in July, 2016 with multiple cervical lymph nodes for two months and non-response to anti-TB treatment. She had received treatment for pre-XDR-TB from October, 2013 till October, 2015. So two years of treatment for pre-XDR with second line drugs consisting of levoflox, amicacin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, ethionamide, and cyclosidine. Yeah, so you have levoflox, amicacin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, ethionamide, and cyclosidine. Now she's finished her TB treatment. A year later, she comes back with multiple cervical lymph nodes. This time, her lymph node biopsy gene expert is done and it shows MTB, which is rifampicin sensitive. So first time she had a pre-HDR and now she has a rifampicin sensitive. She started on first line anti-TB treatment, which is consisting of HRZE, but she has no response. So when she came to us, she has bilateral cervical lymph nodes, two by two centimeter. Chest x-ray showing opacities in the lung. So we did a sputum and the sputum showed MTB, which was resistant to INH, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, oplox, moxiflox. So this was like a pre-XDR pattern. And it was sensitive to amicacin, clopazamine, cyclosidin, linozolid, pass, canamycin, and ethionamide. So she was shifted to amicacin, cyclosidin, pass, linozolid, clopazamine. So you have a relapse of a pre-XDR TB. So either she was not treated properly and she relapsed, or probably she's uh, having some sort of an immunodeficiency that's causing her to get recurrent TB. Now she went on this TB treatment in November, that's almost five months after starting this treatment because she was an amicacin, she was getting her regular urine test done. And uh, the ENT surgeon noticed a swelling in the posterior pharynx, which was a retropharyngeal abscess. She had no problem. She was asymptomatic for that. She had no pain in the neck, no swallowing problems, nothing. And a CT was done. And you can see this. This is the abscess sitting in the posterior pharynx. So there was an abscess in the posterior and the right retropharyngeal area, which was measuring almost four centimeters. It was from the base of the skull up to the vocal cords. And it was compressing the pharynx, leading to a right lateral displacement of the carotid vessels. M mind you, this child is asymptomatic. And because she had come for cervical lymph nodes, the lymph nodes were starting to show calcifications. So that means there was some healing process that was taking place, but she had developed this abscess. What should be done? It's filling up because the abscess is, you know, just filling up. What should we do? Okay, so yeah, so immunodeficiency workup has to be done. Nothing should be done, but then subsequently she became symptomatic. She had difficulty in swallowing. So we had to actually do aspiration of the abscess. Our concern was whether she was not responding to treatment because she was developing these abscess on treatment. 
her gene expert of that abscess showed again rifampicin resistant mtb but that doesn't tell us whether she's failing the treatment because you could have a dead bacilli that could be giving you this result what was important is the tb culture was negative after 6 weeks from the abscess so that tells you that the bacilli is not actually active it's a dead bacillus so why did she develop an abscess when those lymph nodes were calcifying what was the cause of the abscess that was happening so the cause of the abscess is actually a paradoxical reaction what we also call as immune reconstitution in hiv patients we call it as iris so similarly in tb we call it as paradoxical reactions so what is paradoxical reaction when you have an exaggerated immune response when your cell mediated immunity recovers in tb you have an exaggerated immune response and that leads to new symptoms or worsening of the old symptoms sometimes you land up feeling oh this may be just uh, you know failure of treatment you may get uh, tuberculomas coming up so you are treating a tbm and suddenly you get tuberculomas that are coming up but that doesn't mean your treatment is failing it just tells you that this may be a paradoxical reaction you may get suddenly new lymph nodes coming up you may get new onset fever sometimes pleural effusions may develop and most often you may get abscesses that are developing so nothing to be concerned but it's concerning to the parents because you are saying one hand the child is improving and the other hand you're saying look because of the body's immunity you're getting these abscesses so it's very difficult to convince the parents now she continued to have these recurrent retropharyngeal abscesses that required almost fortnightly to monthly drainage she almost required 7 to 8 times drainage so again very difficult to tell them look your child is improving but these abscesses need to be drained so the only way that you can control these kind of immune reaction is probably give a course of steroids what dose of steroids you are supposed to give how long to do you give it will be all individualized based on the response so you will try to maintain at a very low dose or start with a low dose and try to control this paradoxical reaction without giving too high dose steroids so after a year november 2016 she had an abscess and july 2017 she's developed these calcifications of the wall so now the abscess doesn't need to be drained so that's when the abscess drainage was stopped so what so one more thing uh, paradoxical reactions almost occur to the tune of 3 to 10% in all tb patients that you're going to treat so you need to differentiate between tb failure and paradoxical reactions treatment wise uh, if you have recurrence of fever or just lymph nodes no additional treatment just continue with your tb treatment if there are severe reactions like there are deep seated abscesses or massive pleural effusions that develop or large tuberculomas then you may need a approach of medical treatment and surgical approach medical would be systemic steroids as i said duration and dose not known you will have to individualize it so the take home message on this case was not all new clinical signs while being on anti tb treatment means treatment failure if your culture is negative think of paradoxical reactions and you may require steroids or surgical intervention if this reactions are severe mild reactions just continue anti tb treatment now we go on to a third case now this was a 7 and a half year old boy he was referred for management of his mdr pulmonary tb sputum gene expert was rifampicin resistance so he was like an mdr he had a unilateral left sided tuberculous pleural effusion along with the consolidation on the chest x ray at that time may 2028 we used to use canamycin nowadays we don't use that but at that time he was put on canamycin high dose moxiflox now moxiflox you have two doses you give 10 mg per kg which is your low dose or high doses when you use 15 mg per kg he was put on pas cyclosporine and clofazamine so this child came in may one month later he had hemoptysis for four days and the hemoglobin dropped from 8.4 to 6.1 the chest x ray this was his april x ray you can see bad consolidation involving almost the entire left lung and now it started clearing off so there is some improvement that has taken place his ct angio was done because he had uh, those hemoptysis and the angio showed bronchiectasis of the left lung which was expected but there was an aneurysm which was sitting there 
And then he underwent embolization of that aneurysm. So this, this vein was embolized, this artery was embolized. And you can see this aneurysm was taken care of. So the question here is not all hemoptysis, but usually we get a lot of patients with TB, pulmonary TB will come with hemoptysis and we say, oh, it's because of a cavity or it's because of a bronchiectasis. So we usually don't investigate much, but the thing is whenever you have a hemoptysis in a TB patient, always do a pulmonary angio. Because you may sometimes pick up a vessel which is eroding into a cavity. You may sometimes pick up an aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm. And then there is a treatment that is available. So if it's a vessel problem, you can always treat it. If it's bronchiectasis, you usually reassure the parents that it's just bronchiectasis and there will be a little bit amount of hemoptysis that's going to occur. So if it's one teaspoon or two teaspoon, don't worry about it too much. So keep in mind that not all hemoptysis is because of a cavity or bronchiectasis. Always keep in mind a vascular anomaly and never forget to do a pulmonary angio. Now, there are other questions which are difficult to treat in TB, which I'm sure all of you all have faced, especially when you have tuberculomas. And we all know the NTEP guidelines, which I showed you before, were that for neuro TB, you give treatment for one year. It may be drug sensitive TB, but in cases of tuberculomas, you really don't know the treatment duration, how long to give. Say, for example, this child had this tuberculoma sitting here in February 2012. In 2013, it's got a little large, which may be a paradoxical reaction. Nobody's going to go in and do a brain biopsy to see what's happening. And in November, the tuberculoma is still sitting there, 2015. So it's almost three and a half years. The tuberculoma is sitting there. The only thing that has changed is that perilesional edema, which was there initially, is no longer there. How how does one determine whether this tuberculoma is active or not? How long to give TB treatment in such patients is a problem. So we did a study on this and we looked at it from point of view of what would be the outcome of CNS tuberculomas if we stick to the standard therapy. So when do we decide end of therapy? Do we say calcification of tuberculoma is end of therapy? or treatment completion is end of therapy. That means one year of treatment given and that's end of therapy or disappearance of tuberculoma is end of therapy. So there's no fixed guideline on that. What we took in our study was radiological uh, improvement and radiological improvement was either in two ways, either the tuberculoma disappeared or it calcified. And what you see is that when we looked at radiological recovery, those who didn't recover with either calcification or disappearance they required TB treatment for almost 19 months. Whereas the ones who recovered require treatment for almost 14 months. So your standard treatment completion of 12 months doesn't stand true. So whenever you have neuro TB, be very careful as to what duration of TB treatment you're going to give. Sometimes we've given treatment even up to four years. Most of the times these tuberculomas require treatment for almost one and a half to two years. So it's not going to be end of therapy at the end of 12 months. We are looking, I have been talking to a lot of researchers that give me some biomarker which tells me that this tuberculoma is non-active. And the current way, if I'm going beyond two and a half years or three years, then I would do a PET CT to look whether it's active or not. But that would be very individualized. It's not something that you can take a, as a message. The other thing is steroid duration in these tuberculomas when they're active and you're giving them steroids that suppose they are at, they are at certain areas like at the optic chiasma or they are at the midbrain area and you have to give them steroids what would be the duration of steroids that you'll give what would be the dose of steroids that you will give when would you consider thalidomide in these patients so these are questions that are unanswered and it basically depends on the kind of experience that you've had treating these cases and the individualization that you've done for each patient, because you don't want steroid toxicity to occur at the same time, you don't want immunosuppression to occur at that level that he gets something else and you want to control the tuberculoma. So this is another thing that you have to keep in mind. Now, drug resistant TB, this is the algorithm for uh, national TB elimination program. Basically, it's just you do your CBNAT, you decide whether it's rifampicin resistant, sensitive, send your second line or first line LPA, 
depending on its, uh, if it's refer sensitive, you send the first line LPA. If it's refer resistant, you send first line and second line LPA. So, and these are the groupings of the drugs, which keep on changing as newer drugs come, the grouping of the drugs keep on changing and their regimens keep on changing. Now, this was a case who came with fever and cough for 20 days in December, 2020. There was a weight loss and the X-ray had shown right upper zone consolidation. Sputum gene expert showed refar resistant. LPA was suggestive to canamycin, but not to quinolones and amikacin. So she was started on amikacin. This is the time we still didn't have bedaquilin. So amikacin, clofazamine, cyclosurin, linozolid, and moxiflox. Jan 2022, that's 13 months after starting treatment, there's bronchiectasis, there's calcifications, ESRs come down, culture has become negative. 18 months after starting treatment, her repeat culture now is positive and that has shown resistance to even your moxiflox and ethionamide. So now the child is put on salvage. So you have a child who's finished one and a half year of TB treatment, drug resistance, and you still have culture positive. So it's take home message. Don't depend only on one culture. Keep on repeating the cultures. Now this child, because this was the pattern, we had to put in a pick line. We had to put the child on Salvage regimen that consisted of bedaquilin, delaminate, linozolid, amikacin, meropenem, amoxclav, clofazamine, cyclosidin, pass. After three months, her culture was negative, and uh, she has now developed. Uh, Baal was done, that was no growth. VQ scan showed only the right upper zone that was now involved, rest all areas her having good perfusion, and then she underwent a lobectomy. So, Treatment of TB, MDR-TB is not as easy as just treatment completion, doing cultures. You have to devise a regimen. You have to make sure that drugs are reaching. Because if I have a perfusion that is only 3%, no matter what drugs I give, it's not going to reach that part of the lung. And then I may have to actually consider lobectomy. The moment lobectomy was done, her uh, TB treatment injectables were stopped, and then pick line was removed. So. I think this was the first time we did in the country, actually in the world, where we did salvage regimen in children. There have been uh, reports of doing this in adults, but nowhere in children across the world. And that too, teaching the parents to give meropenem at home. So uh, this is something that every patient is precious. You don't want to lose any child. So you go out of your way to whatever extent you can to save a patient. So treatment of TB is not as simple as two months of HRZE and four HRE. There are unusual manifestations while on treatment and one needs to keep a close follow-up for treatment failure. Thank you very much.